this is going to be a threat narrative dialogue with Della Burton and me, Typhon Blue. Threat narrative is essentially a way of amplifying the agency and bad intent of a target group or a target person while de-emphasizing your agency and bad intent and emphasizing your vulnerability to them. So a, a perfect example is, of course, wartime propaganda, which always usually uses some sort of vulnerable woman and child who is going to be menaced by the enemy. And that's sort of a, a pretty popular threat narrative trope is the idea that our women are going to be hurt by the enemy if we don't do something violent towards all those evil men, evil, dark, shadowy men. So it's, it's like the idea that you, you focus in and you emphasize the target group's ability to do harm, specifically their ability to do harm to something that people value, and usually that's women and children. So that's sort of a threat narrative. And uh, throughout the series, I've been, sort of, I've been exploring the various tropes of threat narratives and how they've been used to strip people of their social protections and justify violence against them. So in, in some cases, threat narratives are used against other nations. In other cases, they're used against other groups in our society. And individuals can use them against people they don't like. But today I want to talk about threat narrative and the cycle of empire. So how threat narratives inform the rise and fall of nations and empires and groups. And pretty much anything that has a sense of group cohesion and how that, how that group cohesion forms and then is exploded over time, destroyed over time. So I'll direct this to you, Della, if you've noticed as I've described these threat narratives that feminist theory, all of its components like male privilege and rape culture and, and all of that, um, how well it, it, it resembles sort of a Frankensteinian mishmash of the threat narrative directed against Jewish people historically and the threat narrative directed against black people. I mean, because it has that component of, of having this sort of sinister cabal ruling the world and also that sort of bestial, at the same time, that sort of bestial, dangerous, violent sexuality that was ascribed to black men. And, pedof well, pedophilia was ascribed to Jewish men, but also that, that, that sinister, they control everything for the benefit of, of only Jewish people. And then, and then also the black men, they're, they're raping apes who want to, you know, just want to dismember the, the delicate, soft, lamb-like gentle flesh of woman of white womanhood and it's it you, they, you take those two tropes those two those two most popular threat narratives in history and you smash them together and you essentially get feminist theory you yeah know, that's pretty much true um they have a uh, a huge amount of of uh, academic research and academic i guess promulgation um targeting men with a sort of a demonization effort, complete with terminology and excuses for why they can apply uh, certain ideas towards men that are really not gendered ideas. Yeah. Uh, like, the, like the ideas of toxic masculinity. A lot of what they ascribe to men in the uh, toxic, toxic masculinity idea is really dysfunction that happens with people of both sexes. And they simply claim that this is male behavior in order to make it fit their narrative. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, or it's alternatively, it's behavior of people who are, you know, disenfranchised in certain ways. It's true that, uh, that uh, people... In, uh, who are impoverished circumstances tend to have more social dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, with, with the threat narratives directed at Jewish people and black people um, and men as a whole by feminism, the, the same problem arises. Instead of saying, well, why are they like this? And actually answering, the way, the, answering that question in a way that preserves the target's humanity, instead they just say it's inherent to the group or yep. it's inherent Terrible. inherent to the group's culture if we don't oversee them and make sure that their behavior conforms to what we say they should do and uh so it's it's very consistent with the threat narrative and w what i was getting at by pointing out the feminist theory is sort of sort of a uh uh 
this combination of Jewish peril and black peril is um, my idea at how it ties into the greater idea of how threat narrative governs the rise and fall of empires is this. The real difference between feminists, feminist women, and conservative women is that conservative women still embody a threat narrative that's directed outward towards external groups of men. So they still see the, they still see the threat in terms of Muslim men, immigrant men, men of other cultures, um, uh, communists. <laughs> yeah. And it's, so the, to them, their threat narrative is directed outward at men outside of their group. What happens with feminism is they have exactly the same threat narrative and they direct it to men in their group. So it's, it's a threat narrative that was originally directed outward and has become a threat narrative that's directed inward towards all men. Well, that does make sense. Um, and I, I can see your point that I was raised in a pretty conservative family. And the one thing I would say about conservative women is that that, that threat narrative is pretty much, it's not always directed at men. Mm -hmm. Not that it isn't directed at men, but that sometimes you'll see the same thing directed at women. And it's it's basically different thinking people. Anybody that disagrees with the conservative point of view, if you aren't the social conservative, then you just want to warp everybody else's ideas about sex and family. And if you're not the fiscal conservative, it's because you want to control everybody else's money. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason that it gets applied to men more than women is because the same myth, I think, runs between both groups, and that is that men have all the power, mm -hmm. even though they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or at least men are the most threatening, or men are the pawns on the board that need to be destroyed. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's... The essential idea here is this idea that the threat narrative has changed focus rather than being towards external groups. And really, if you think about it, most threat narratives, when they come to a point where they clash, it's always men who are caught in the middle. Um, but it's going from a threat narrative that is an external group to a threat narrative that's in internalized. So it's a threat narrative within the group itself that's being applied within the group itself. And I think that that sort of explains um, basically the rise and fall of empires. What happens is you have people coalescing around a threat narrative. And originally the threat narrative is against the people outside of the group. So it's against the Huns or, you know, it's against whatever large nation is bordering your nation. And as long as that threat narrative pressure is, ex is, is external, is 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 pressing externally and directed externally, the empire manages to maintain an internal cohesion. But as soon as the empire either loses its external threats or they become to the point where they're insignificant, like uh, the Roman emperor, empire just became so large and powerful that nothing really threatened it. Um, and and that you, you, stop, you stop having an external focus to your threat narrative, the threat narrative pressure is still there. It's still building. So what ends up happening is the threat narrative pressure turns inward, and then it starts to fracture the empire with these competing um, interests. Uh, interests, competing internal threat narratives, and people coalescing around competing internal threat narratives and it's that eventually the empire disintegrates under the pressure of all these competing internal threat narratives. So what we're seeing now with um, uh, you know the politics in western nations is we've gone from having a, a western threat narrative that was external directed at you know uh, either uh, lands that needed to be that were that were there to be conquered and people that needed to be dispossessed of their lands and all of all of the 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 initial outward thrust of empire and all of the threat narratives that can be directed against the people who prevent that outward thrust and now it's gone inward and it's beginning the slow process of putrefaction of the empire of breaking it down into smaller and smaller bits until it can no longer keep itself together and 
the reality is that as long as we live under this particular dysfunction, as long as we fell prey to these pressures, that's what's going to happen. Empires will rise and then they will inevitably crumble because the same thing that caused them to rise, this threat narrative pressure building up and mobilizing people or men mostly against the external threats, this, this threat narrative pressure that caused them to expand, caused them to maintain their boundaries, caused them to keep this cohesion, this same pressure is what causes them to inevitably decay into, into well, a skeleton of an empire, into the, these competing interests. So in order to, in order to end this cycle, we have to challenge the pressure threat narrative itself. Well, that's actually kind of a hard one. I think it's, it's an innate human behavior in a way, not so much um, that we can't help it, but that I don't think people always know they're doing it. Mm -hmm. I don't think people are always conscious of um, their personal behavior related to the threat narrative. And so, I mean, there's always going to be an extent of an us versus them mentality with that idea that, you know, they are stronger and they have bad intent. And uh, especially if you have a political point of view with, to go with it of any kind. But the, the, the idea is not necessarily to challenge the outward manifestation of a threat narrative. Not to say, well, these, this behavior or this, this attitude is wrong, this attitude is wrong, this attitude is wrong. Instead, it's to look at why people hold those attitudes. Why do people feel so compelled to form threat narratives, to manifest their identities through? Like, that's really why we're so tied to them, because these threat narratives gives us, give us something. And if we can identify what they give us and then address it, then there might be a way to resolve the problem and then we don't have to deal with another Dark Ages, <laughs> which is sort of what, what this seems to, that these cycles inevitably seem to lead to, is yeah. that this build up and then this tearing down and then a Dark Ages and then people build up again and tear down and Dark Age. And it's, it's, it's sort of a, it seems like it's sort of tiresome. <laughs> sort of a cycle that the uh, human race goes through. Yeah. And what I was thinking in terms of, of dealing with the pressure, what causes the, the threat narrative pressure, what causes us to want to form into threat narratives, it, it really, I think, comes out of, of the dynamic between men and women and the particular weaknesses, I think, that men and women have psychologically that ends up having it so that we have women who embody a threat narrative, who seek to embody a threat narrative like we have conservative women who want to embody a threat narrative uh, but in their particular threat narrative is external um so they want to be able to say these groups are wrong and and or well well so do feminist women but it's more internal um so we have women who want to be able to say these people are wrong these people don't belong to my group and then we have men who want to sort of be the cells of women's threat narratives and and uh, sort of enact uh, the expulsion of these people. You know what I mean? These, the, the fighting, the, uh, the aggression between threat narratives. That desire sort of falls along the lines of wanting to be the, the protector, wanting to be the person that makes things happen for the, the women and children in your group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So uh, men, or sorry, women want to feel like they are in charge of who belongs and who doesn't belong in a group. And they do that by embracing these threat narratives that explain who belongs and who doesn't belong and perpetuating these threat narratives throughout the generations. And I mean, if you, if you read a lot of, uh, about how these, these, these generational conflicts keep perpetrating through the generations, it's really the mothers teaching their children. They teach their sons that those are guys, those people over there are the enemy. And they teach their daughters, okay, that you have to teach your children that those people over there are the enemy. Generation after generation after generation, mothers are imprinting these, these lessons on their children. And that's how these generational conflicts keep, just keep perpetuating. And, um, I mean, part of that is just because women really have that particular well, they, I think they have that a social role, and I think it's also a biological role. Mammals first learn what is safe and what is not safe from their mothers. I mean, and it's, it, it goes, it, it, that's such a powerful initial programming. 
Um, so mothers become model uh, their children's first experience of belonging. I mean, the first relationship that you have is between you and your mother. It's the first right. understanding of myself and other. And so it, it makes absolute sense that as we grow up, we still retain that, that idea that women are the ones who decide who belongs to a group and who doesn't belong. They are the ones who decide a threat narrative. And a threat narrative essentially is who belongs, who doesn't belong, what behaviors suit the group, what behaviors don't suit the group. Which people exhibit the behaviors that suit the group, which people don't exhibit the behaviors that suit the group. And you can see that even, I mean, it, you can do a really quick test of this if you look at anything in Hollywood, um, watch any movie, and if, first of all, if there's a male character and he is mean at all to a woman, you know he's the villain. Yeah. Instantly. And unless he's been established as a maverick, but usually they they still have to be nice to women at some point or they have to be able to save women um, better than a person who isn't, you know, crotchety and, and sort of mavericky. But yeah. um, so yeah. there's a, a little bit of there's a little bit of leeway for jerk assery. But for the most part, if if a guy is is seen and the first thing he does is, is mean being mean to a woman, he is automatically cast as a villain. And because he has sort of divide, defied a fundamental taboo, and that fundamental taboo is the idea that women decide who belong and who don't belong, and women's benefit decides who belongs and who doesn't belong. So you can immediately cast someone out of the, the audience's sense of, of belonging by having him be mean to a woman. And then the other thing is that if you watch movies, I mean, just count how many times you see this sequence of scenes. Something dramatic happens, and the the camera immediately goes to a woman's reaction to it. Is yeah, that... that's true. Uh, the female reaction is kind of used to to determine the audience reaction. Yeah, that's exactly what they're what's happening. Is the woman is modeling whether or not we should feel what we should feel about what has just happened, what we should feel about the people that it's just happened to, or the people who would what what they've been doing. It, it, essentially a woman decides again the threat narrative you know is this a threat is this not a threat who is causing the threat who isn't causing the threat who is benefiting the audience who isn't benefiting the audience the woman is actually a stand-in for the so story-wide threat narrative and what's going on with that the damsel in distress is actually the most powerful character in a story because she's the one who determines everything She's the one that determines if something is bad or good, if a character is bad or good, which actions are bad or good, um, if somebody belongs, if someone doesn't belong. You know, she determines everything in the story. She, she, without her, it would be a meaningless story. It wouldn't. There, no one would would really have a reference point to understand the drama of the story. And that's because she is the epicenter of the threat narrative. She is the magnetic field in which all the other characters arrange themselves. Groups throughout history that embody threat narratives. Or did you want to say anything to that? Sorry, before I continue. No, I think that was actually pretty complete. Okay. Just just ask any questions if you have them or if you think oh, about I will. I haven't clarified anything. So to get to to just look at the 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 damsel in distress and and the various tropes that surround her. I mean, if you look throughout history, the people that embody threat narratives like the nobility, um, and uh, people of high status, um, the reason why they embody threat narratives is because they embody the sense of belonging of the society. You know, if you look at the queen, the queen represents our patriotism as members of the Commonwealth. I know that you're American, so you probably don't under don't necessarily relate to this very well, but um, she represents our sense of belonging in a greater whole. And nobility did that; they represented the belonging of the entire society in a greater whole. And because they represented the sense of belonging, and all groups that represent our sense of belonging have very similar traits. Nobility, rich people, you know, all of that, uh, clergy, they all have very similar traits and they all engage in very similar activities. The first thing that they do is they emphasize their value and they do that through costumes that are incredibly elaborate 
and ornate and eye-catching and often often consume a lot of space um so you know you'll you'll you see like uh look at through pictures of kings they have these enormous um outfits on and you know I mean, you look at them and they're like what what could you do in that except maybe fall over right yeah. and then they're wearing high heels and hose and like elaborate jewelry and it's just everything is to emphasize i have value just by existing and you should orientate yourself to my value you should derive your sense of belonging from my value and uh and it also the the reality is that these costumes that you know high-ranking um, church members and nobles and rich people wear also limit their mobility so they make them vulnerable and they, it's, it's, a, it's a visual display of value but also vulnerability and the reason why is because they can it's it's expensive vulnerability they are saying I can afford to be vulnerable because someone else can take care of my safety and security and this idea of vulnerability plays on uh, plays also on the, the the real the real currency of a threat narrative. The people who control threat narratives, the people who dominate threat narratives, use their vulnerability to dominate others. Because others derive a sense of belonging, their vulnerability becomes a way of manipulating other the people who derive their sense of the belonging from them, the the cells of the threat narrative. Their sense of vulnerability becomes a way of manipulating these cells into doing what they want. Actually, I'm thinking that there's there is some similarity with uh, politicians in the United States. Um, it, it's not so much with the volume of the costumes as it is they they're having to wear specific styles. And if you look at the type of suits that uh, men in particular. Mm -hmm. in high-ranking positions where there's not a lot that you can do in a three-piece suit. And it, it, when you get into um, higher politics, if you look at, like, the president, mm -hmm. he can't go anywhere or do anything because he's always uh, vulnerable to assassination. He has to have a whole team mm -hmm. of security, of law enforcement security, to protect him from assassination. And they have to they have to be there, and they have to uh, be ready to protect him, whether there's an immediate threat or not, or whether there's ever been a threat or not, because it, at any moment there might be one. Mm -hmm. And he's not expected in any way to, you know, protect himself at all. Yep. Um, yeah, and so he has to have a huge entourage when he goes any place because of that. Yeah, and in, in fact, there's a whole there's a whole like genre of a fiction that's inspired specifically by the vulnerability of the president. Yes. And, and that really ties in with the idea of, of how he controls the threat narrative of, of, uh, and the sense of belonging of, uh, the American people, because it's his vulnerability that manipulates, uh, patriotism. Yes. And, and, and if you, uh, watch American politics, you'll you'll see people sort of build up a similar narrative around those politics where each side accuses the other side's um, grassroots and, and their higher politicians of all kinds of conspiracy ideas and everything. There's a great deal of, it's not quite hatred, but, but feuding that goes on between you know, the political left and the political right in the United States to the point where whoever's party is in power in the, in the presidency treats the other one like a threat all the time. Yep. Yep. And, uh, and it really is like, uh, like, a, like, a, like we were talking about just these, these competing threat narratives and, um, and the, but the, but governed by that sense of vulnerability that sense that we have this valuable, valuable representation of our sense of belonging, and we need to protect it from the outsiders. And that mm -hmm. valuable representation of our sense of belonging, the uh, people who embody that, people who embody a threat narrative, who, who dominate a threat narrative, use their vulnerability to control the people who are dominated by a threat narrative. The more you dominate a threat narrative, 
the more you can use your vulnerability as a currency within it to manipulate the people dominated by the threat narrative to do things. So vulnerability in the context of someone who embodies the belonging within a threat narrative is actually an incredibly aggressive, dominant, and uh, dominant act. Uh, displaying vulnerability becomes an incredibly dominant act, dominating act. And so throughout history, we see nobles and church, uh, high church officials and politicians displaying vulnerability as a dominant act and, um, and creating displays of vulnerability as dominant acts. So if you look at it in that context, if you, if you are a person who controls belonging, the belonging of a threat narrative, and obviously women embody belonging of a society just naturally, just as a, as a matter of uh, almost like a biological eventuality of being mothers, um, and then they display a vulnerability, they are actually engaging in a dominant act, a dominating act, a way of controlling other people. And uh, so if, if you look at it that, in that context, women's fashion makes a lot more sense because women's fashion is a reflection of, of, uh, of maximizing the same things that, that people who, um, groups who embody threat narratives, who are dominant over threat narratives have throughout history, their vulnerability and their value. Also a way of identifying like with like. If you want to be part of a specific group, you have to look like that group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, the, the whole thing about women's fashion and um, the threat narrative and who decides, you know, women deciding who belongs and who doesn't belong takes me kind of right back to the whole high school clicking thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, although I, I was in a, a high school that's kind of unusual. We didn't have hard lines between the cliques. If you were uh, popular, you weren't necessarily only popular. And if you were a nerd, you weren't necessarily only a nerd. But the cliques were still there mm -hmm. and groups uh, that were in those cliques dress alike. If you were a preppy, you had to have penny loafers. If you didn't have penny lo loafers, you didn't look like a preppy. And if you were a skater, you had to have skids. And if you didn't wear skids, you didn't look like a skater. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, and it really was the girls that, that kind of controlled that. Mm -hmm. Well, they controlled that sense of belonging, like who was within. It's sort of like a like they were training, like they were practicing to become full fledged uh, queens over uh, over uh, adult uh, threat narratives. Yes. So they were just practicing, and and they were establishing uniforms and uh, and uh, colors for their nations and uh, and uh, and roles. Within. Yeah, and if you uh, flaunted the rules, if you flaunted the dress rules, if you flaunted the behavioral rules, you were a threat. Well, that's what they're doing. They're establishing uh, conformity. They're establishing a sense of unity within their particular groups, which is exactly what women have done throughout history, is establish threat narratives and decide who belongs, who doesn't belong, what behaviors they're allowed to engage in, and also their, 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 their physical signifiers of group cohesion that women are the ones who embody to, to pull that out again it's just this idea that when somebody is dominant over a threat narrative they actually engage in emphasizing their vulnerability and their value and they do that through costume that restricts their movement or even in some cases going so far as to physically uh pr create physical vulnerabilities that otherwise wouldn't exist like foot binding or corsetry or neck rings so that you create artificial vulnerabilities but these vulnerabilities are means of controlling people because you control the belonging of a society um so the the idea is uh, that i'm getting at is that this threat narrative pressure is caused because of a friction between the roles that men play and the roles that women play Women want to create, want to embody a threat narrative. They want to manufacture a threat narrative. They want to create these groups, decide the belonging, create this, the systems of belonging, create the social mores of belonging. And men, in turn, 
want to embody the things, the, the, the threat narratives that women generate. They want to protect them. They want to in, engage in behaviors that benefit the women who are part of them, etc. So it's that friction. And the reason why men want to do that is because they want a sense of identity. Because they derive a sense of belonging from women, they want to serve women's benefit to generate an identity. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, I mean, I think it goes even deeper than that, and that's what I got into with, with shedding the slave skin, is this idea that in serving the threat narrative, men generate an idea that they are, in fact, regaining some of the power that they feel that they don't have. So it's like uh, it's it's like they they feel because women are giving off this sense within the context of the threat narrative, they're giving off these displays of vulnerability. Men derive a sense of being needed and being powerful from these threat narratives, and that's very addictive. So you end up with this friction that we have to constantly create these threat narratives to maintain this 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 dynamic between men and women these constantly manufacturing these threat narratives maintain this dynamic to give men this sense of of identity of um of 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 potency that they don't feel like they really have so they have to turn to a to embodying a threat narrative to get it and the sense of belonging and then in turn women have this compulsion to create these threat narratives and they have a compulsion to create these threat narratives, and what's interesting is why. And I, I, I'll get into that eventually. But so, so it's because we have these compulsions to create these threat narratives, we're sort of driven constantly. This pressure builds up, and when the threat narrative is directed outward in a society, when all the women agree that it's the communists who really need to be killed, you know, we have cohesion. But when we don't have an external threat, we still have this pressure to create threat narratives to, to, to for women to um, to uh, dominate a threat narrative and men to embody it. And where does it go? It goes into breaking down the empire that was originally created by by opposing the external force, right? And then you have feuding groups creating threat narratives against each other. Yeah, and then breaking apart the empire. So the the reality is that we, we we really can't afford this anymore, I don't think. Like, I mean, if we want to continue with the culture that we have and the level of sophistication of, of our of our of our uh, of our technology and our the sophistication of our communication systems we really have to, you know, stop indulging in this sort of destructive behavior. Not I and mean, not just because it won't sustain and just because it's not really ethical in my opinion. Well, actually, it, it's not something that we don't have to to stop indulging. I can't really disagree with that. Um mm -hmm. but what I think is it's it's going to be something that we're going to have to make people more aware of. Mm -hmm. Because I really do think there are a lot of instances where people do this without realizing they're doing it. They do it without thinking about it, um, kind of instinctively. And with something like that, you really can't fight something that is like an instinct unless you're made aware that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, of course. When, you know, once you have that knowledge and that understanding of this is dysfunction, not function, mm -hmm. then you can look at the behavior and think, okay, I need to break this habit. Mm -hmm. and, and start working on breaking that habit. And you have to start breaking the thought patterns that lead to that habit. Mm -hmm. And you have to actually start altering your thought patterns and, and developing more of an independent attitude, uh, less of a, like women would have to develop less of a, uh, a perpetual sense of helplessness. Mm -hmm. This sort of a, and I've seen, like teenage girls will be really good at this, though. They'll, they'll have this, willful helplessness uh, where they'll come up with ridiculous excuses why they can't achieve something and somebody else has to help them do it and if somebody else doesn't help them do it they can't have it and it's the most important thing in the world um <laughs> it's it's they're practicing uh dominance through vulnerability right and it, if if we can train our kids to instead you know both sexes think for yourself instead of demanding that somebody else help you with it if nobody is willing to help you or if you look at the item and you think well this isn't really that hard to do 
you know, maybe you start figuring out your own solutions instead of feigning helplessness and insisting that somebody else step in for you. And, um, yeah, I guess that might be what, what kind of makes a difference between women who are feminists and women who are not feminists or who are anti-feminists is that in some ways we kind of get used to having to solve our own problems at some point in life and, and we continue with that. And then when we turn around and look at the women who are immersed in the threat narrative culture, um, it, it doesn't look right to us anymore. No. Well, it looks it looks sort of dysfunctional and toxic because it well part of the reason why is it's uncom for me it's really uncomfortable to dominate through vulnerability. It's yes. it's uncomfortable. Well, having said that, you know, I think everybody every every person sort of indulges in that in a little bit, and I think that's okay. You know, it's like uh, I'm going to pretend like I can't cook, so I don't have to, sort of thing. But I yeah. mean, if there's a if there's a mutual mutual stuff going on if someone's better at something then I don't think it's that toxic but if if it's something that's like you go it's your go-to for most of your activities in your life is to dominate through vulnerability then it starts to become very limiting because the other thing is that when you dominate through vulnerability when you engage in that mindset whenever you encounter something novel or something unexpected you immediately shut down like you, you you just like oh I can't do it Somebody else do it for me. And then you just sort of bat your eyes. And I, 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 could somebody, could a big strong man, could he help me? You know, sort of yeah. shit. Um, and it's, it's, it's like, it's like a huge waste of potential. If people are, if women are being taught that, that's how they, they live their life is just to, to dominate through vulnerability. You know, it's, it's like, what could they achieve if they stopped doing that? I mean, I'm not saying they would necessarily achieve the same things as men, but I think they could achieve, and I don't even want to compare, but something different. You know what I mean? Oh, can achieve great things by um, really ceasing to practice the threat narrative and, and uh, stepping forward to, to handle things themselves. I mean... If you look at the women in history that have done great things, they've actually not women who are famous for things, but women who have actually done great things. Um, you don't see them begging somebody else for help or standing back and saying, somebody should do something about this. Mm -hmm. You see them deciding, well, I'm somebody, I'll take care of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that attitude is a real empowerment. It's not feminist empowerment, like, oh, we'll just say that that women can do anything. Uh, well, how can women do anything? Well, just because they're women. Well, that's not an answer. It's I mean, like that chant they have that it's completely senseless. I, I'd i never heard it before the um, before the YouTube video. Of the, women I, hold I up. it's a Toronto protest. Women hold up half the sky. What the hell does... I have no idea what that means. I, I'm not tall enough to hold up the sky. But, but, uh, <laughs> it's just like it's like a it's like a statement that it's like okay, well that's really fatuous praise. Well well and then also, you know, who holds up the other half? Men. Okay. What was your point of chanting this? <laughs> yeah, that was a really good question. Yeah, and it, and if it it is half men and half women, then it isn't really that important of a chant anyway. No, it's like it's not really that important of a concept. It's inane, but it's it's this uh, it's this sort of fatuous praise, and I've always had a problem with empty praise. I I I just it just made my skin crawl when people would say stupid like just like oh women women are so empathetic and women are so, and, and my skin would just be crawling. It'd just be like oh it just. Yeah, it feels awful to hear that, and I actually didn't realize why it is that my skin would crawl. Like, you know, I can I can sit there and uh, not really absorb, but just listen to MGTOWs bitching about women. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, because sometimes you know you need to bitch, but um, all day long, and it 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 rarely causes me to get you know raise an eyebrow. But when someone says 
women are so special. They're so empathetic. They're so in tune with nature and, and they're so wonderful. That would make my skin crawl. And I actually now have a, a scientific sort of research why. Apparently, those statements that those sort of um, those um, what feminists call benevolent sexism, those chivalrous statements cause women to to focus on their appearance. And, th and the reason why they do it is because they're emphasizing their role as as uh, embodying a threat narrative. I mean, when, when you say that women are special and you say that they're, they're more empathetic, what you're saying is women embody a threat narrative. They embody the sense of belonging of a society. And when you do that, you're saying to women that your effective presence is, 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 your, is your appearance. The whole appearance thing, that actually makes me think of something. And it's probably something that I've thought of simply because I can't participate in it. Um, and that's altering one's appearance to make oneself look more vulnerable using essentially paint. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm allergic to most makeup. Mm -hmm. and I'm also too lazy to hunt down the makeup that I'm not allergic to or make my own, even though I know how. Mm -hmm. So I don't wear any makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do know a little bit here and there about makeup. And I've, I've learned, you know, some of the techniques that women are supposed to use to, to make themselves up and what's popular and I know where I work, I sell makeup and uh, looking at the instructions that come with it and the pictures that come with it to promote it and everything. The, the specific purpose of it seems to be to increase that kind of doe-eyed, vulnerable look, even in a makeup that's designed to make women look tougher or more edgy or, you know, hard-edged or anything like that. It still emphasizes wide-eyed innocence and and looking more feminine and looking more vulnerable uh, um, and it's like we if we go for that we have to make ourselves look vulnerable in order to fit in and be considered feminine yep yep and well that's because we have and what's really interesting about these so-called sex roles is they're really not um, throughout history, nobles and clergy and any any person any person of power and wealth who embodied a threat narrative, who embodied the sense of belonging in a society, would emphasize his value and his vulnerability. You know, it's it's just as simple as that. I mean, is it is it a sex role? Would you say that the Ottoman, you know, the Sultan was a woman, and the and the the Janissaries were men? No, that but that was exactly the so, sorry. I said no, absolutely not. Or would you say that nobles were women? Like you know, the 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 king of England is a woman, and the 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 serfs and peasants are are men. No, but that's exactly the same dynamic you see there. The nobles embodied the threat narrative, therefore they emphasized their vulnerability and their value in their clothing, in their makeup, because they men did wear makeup then when they were were considered to also embody threat. Well, hell. Men who uh, go on TV, like our politicians, wear makeup, too. Well, actually, there are social groups in which, um, to become more popular, men actually wear makeup. Mm -hmm. And it's different. Um, it's different in that it's, it's a more modern, it's considered more masculine in a, a modern context. But they're still doing the same thing. They're still emphasizing the wide-eyed look and they're still emphasizing the vulnerable look but you see that throughout history is that the people who embody and dominate threat narratives emphasize their value and their vulnerability the people who are dominated by threat narratives who do not have do not control the sense of belonging of a threat narrative of a culture of a group of a nation of a church they're actually actively repressed from emphasizing their value and their vulnerability because it's not for them that that is the aristocratic that right. you know that's the clergy that gets to do that that's rich people that are actually the i mean look at the sumptuary laws certain people were not allowed to wear expensive you know constricting clothing because it would make them look above their above their station so certain groups embodied the sense of belonging of a culture and those groups emphasized their value and their vulnerability those other groups who were were dominated by a threat narrative, they didn't, and they weren't allowed to. 
And so if you, if you, if you apply that to men and women, what women are doing is by emphasizing their vulnerability and their value has nothing to do with femininity and everything to do with, with what, what every group throughout history who dominates others through the threat narrative has done. And, and, and like I said, is, can you say the Sultan is a woman and the Janissaries were men? Can you say the King of England was a woman and his peasants are men? No, but ex except it's the same dynamic. It's the same activities. So this isn't really femininity and masculinity. This is something else entirely. Yeah, you talk about oh, uh, the what was the laws? Type Sumptuary. Of laws about, yeah, we were talking about that. You think about it. Um, you know, today women dominate the threat narrative, mm -hmm. and today it's it's not considered extremely abnormal for women to wear clothing that is traditionally um, currently traditionally thought of as male clothing mm -hmm. but the the minute a man steps into women's clothing there are social taboos and yeah. he gets treated as if he's doing something wrong yeah and it's exactly the same as the sumptuary laws you're perfectly fine if you want to dress down as an aristocrat you'll probably raise a few eyebrows but if a peasant wants to wear something, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> if a peasant wants to wear aristocrats' clothing, that, that, nope. And, I mean, with peasants, they really couldn't afford it. But what where the sumptuary laws came into effect was that merchant class who could afford the expensive clothing that was usually reserved for the nobles. Um, and they would have to have restrictions on the kind of clothing, the kind of value that they could present to the world. And that was why, is because they were not allowed to embody the sense of belonging of a society. And groups that are not allowed to embody the sense of belonging of a society have extremely restricted clothing choices. And and it has, again, it, it isn't because these clothing choices are feminine. These clothing choices, it, it's just, it, I think it's a confluence. What we're seeing now with women's clothing choices is sort of a confluence between embodying a threat narrative, uh, the kind of stuff that you see with aristocrats, which is a whole like genealogical group, so men and women embodying a threat narrative, and then just purifying this idea that only women embody threat narratives. Um, well, I guess our politicians to some extent, but for the most part in our society now, it's pretty much purely women who are allowed to embody threat narratives physically. And and when you see that purification, it's just this, it's just this, this race to, to between women to look the most vulnerable. And that's by, and one of the things that makes you look more vulnerable is exposing more skin mm -hmm. and to look the most valuable, like the, 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 to, this race to look fragile and valuable. And it's just, it's, it's really interesting and it's really interesting that this race really began like if you think about it this this obsession with this thinness with this this youthful childlike body really began with feminism silence <laughs> i really hadn't thought about that but it it really kind of does which is which is interesting because uh, again, it, it, feminism really is that clarification. Like before, it was sort of threat narratives were sort of muddled. Men as 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 nobles, as upper class, as wealthy could sort of embody threat narratives. But after feminism, we really see that delineation. Only women embody threat narratives, and men are either the people who comply with the threat narratives that men, women embody or they are villains in the threat narratives that women embody. So it's a sort of clarification. And we see this as, as, as sex roles, but they're really not. These are social roles. So anyway, maybe I'll leave it at that. Well, I know we kind of talked a little bit about how um, politicians can embody the identity of a people and can, um, can in some ways embody the threat narrative, but there's a very distinct difference between the way a politician does it, and particularly a male politician does it, in the way uh, women do it, women dominate more individual threat narratives. Um, and, and it's more of a, uh, it's about her. Mm -hmm. Whereas the politician, 
doesn't really embody as much of a personal threat narrative as a national or, or a social threat narrative. Even the idea of, of the president and, and anything that could happen to the president, the president getting voted out of office, the president not being liked by half the population, um, the idea that if you criticize a president who's black, you're racist, or if you criticize a president who's of a specific religion, you're against that religion. Um, all of that is more community oriented. Mm -hmm. you, know, you couldn't say, like, that's one of the things that gets used by Obama's supporters is you can't criticize Obama because he's black, and if you criticize him, that's because you hate black people. Well, they, they can't lay that on him unless the entire threat narrative surrounding Obama is the community as opposed to Obama individually. Yeah, so he represents the community uh, of black people as opposed to just his individuality as a black man. Right. Which is really borgifying. But when you said that, something occurred. Um Presidents generally take great pains to not only say, not only embody this idea of uh, of the national threat narrative that the that they are vulnerable, but also that they benefit women. That they yeah. they take a lot of pains to show that they benefit women, and I wonder if that's really buying into that a whole idea that women control the threat narrative and those things that benefit them are beneficial to society as a whole, to the threat narrative as a whole. So they are demonstrating how, at the same time as they are embodying the threat narrative of, of a nation, they are, also they are also demonstrating how they are orientated towards the threat narrative of that nation's women and how they can benefit them, how they serve the threat narrative of the nation's women. And they're very, I mean, we what we see in, in American culture is like layer after layer after layer of these these incredibly powerful men demonstrating that they they provide for women's benefit, right? With more and more social threat programs within a threat narrative. Yeah, more and more social programs. And I wonder if that's not just for women, but also for men. It is. It's who can be the best benefactor. Mm -hmm. it, you demonstrate your power by being a provider. Well, the ultimate provider is the one that comes up with the best social program that provides for the most people, particularly women and children. Well, almost exclusively women and children. And uh, if you notice, when in the, I don't know if this is everywhere, but in the United States, when they start talking about women and children, it's like it's one word. Mm -hmm. Women and children. Women are not individuals anymore. It's women and children. And children are not individuals anymore. And it's it's because women take their their vulnerability on to themselves. Mm -hmm. It's because women are associated with um, nurturing the children. Women are associated with being the caregivers, being the guardians of the children. Um, then that adds to that threat narrative. The vulnerability. Vulnerability, right? Actually, I would say something even darker. I think women have usurped what rightfully belongs to children. Yes. Children, women are adults. They are not supposed to, like, I think in a in normal, natural, if you took human beings in the wild, you know, uh, undomesticated human males and females, I really, I, I'm not so sure we would see as much of this kind of behavior because when you're in that situation, if you're an adult, you've got to pull your weight. Nobody's right. going to pull it for you. Um, they'll leave you to be eaten. Um, so in that situation, all of this, this energy, this, the, the children would be the center of the threat narrative. So what we see now is women have sort of usurped the role of children as the center of the threat narrative at the same time as they still have an adult level of, you know, manipulative and intellectual capacity to do harm with that and to dominate with that. So it's yep. it's like there it's not even women and children it's more like women women and women, you yes. know it's it's like children are are not even there, and it's I know it's a really dark thing to say but it's like children have been pushed out of where they should be, which is maybe why children don't even get the same sympathy as women get, you know I mean I've seen, I've seen children be blamed for their own abuse, in. And there's no but there's no group of people that says, "Hey, no, that's bad. 
like there is with with women who are rape victims you they they have this they, there are groups that say that that's bad to be victim blaming women for their victimization but we don't have groups that say you know if a kid is acting out there's probably a reason yeah yeah and uh we blame the kid it's... especially if it's the mother if it's the mother who's abusive we blame the kid yeah and, or call the kid a liar yeah kinds of uh Everything that you're not supposed to do when a woman is claiming to be a victim is okay if it's a child. Yeah. And I mean, to, I mean, there's, I mean, this is not an absolute statement. There are shades of gray here. Because well, and then uh, when you do get it accepted, when it becomes so bad or so blatant that you can't deny that, you know, the society cannot deny this woman has abused this child. There was a, uh, a news story here in Ohio a few years ago where a woman um, is accused of, of murdering her baby by putting the baby in the microwave. Oh. And the, they know that the baby did end up in the microwave. Um, and the mother had some really lame excuses, one of which was, I couldn't have done it because I was too drunk and and tried to blame one of her other children. And, of course, because it was just the mother and the children in the house, there's no getting to the bottom of this and being absolutely sure that one side's story is the truth and one side's story is not the truth. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you still have a woman who was so neglectful that whether it was herself that did it or whether it was one of the little kids that did it, the baby ended up in the microwave and and was killed by the microwave oven's function. And um, as soon as it got to that point where it was, you know, you can't ignore that. That's something that is, is blatant and obvious. There is a dead baby and the baby died in a horrible way. Then the community turned around from the protective instinct and, and the behavior where, um, you know, the try to come up with excuses for the woman and try to come up with reasons why, well, maybe she didn't do it or maybe it happened because of something that wasn't her fault. You know, maybe she was, because a lot of times they try to blame if a woman is abusive, they'll try to blame the husband or boyfriend. Well, he made her do it mm -hmm. uh, in this case. And, and it's the women around me were the ones who talked about it the most. And the level of condemnation for this woman was just absolute. You know, they, they talked about violent things that should be done to her, uh, wanting her to have the death penalty, that, uh, you know, she was going to go to hell when she died. And, you know, when one lady talked about how demons were going to eat her soul for all eternity. I mean, it was like as soon as... She, she was cast out as a group she was no longer a woman and as soon as she was no longer a woman and she was no longer part of the group she was no longer on their side of the threat narrative and they could do anything they wanted to her they became some of the most vicious people that I'd, I'd ever met yeah well the problem with condemnation and it's a truly horrific thing that you know like it's awful I can't imagine dying in a freaking microwave as a child like ever it's, it's inexplicable like it's it, but at the same time what the fuck happened to her to make her like that you know it's what happened to this woman to cause her to be in, in a situation where drinking is preferable to taking care of your kids yeah like that's not functional behavior either and yeah. The reality is that before women become women, they are girls. They are children. Yeah, and, and at some point, she lost uh, her way along the path from childish behavior to adult functionality and, and went way off the path. Yeah, but I mean, the other thing is that because they don't, like, because we seem to think, we seem to put women first... In a lot of ways, we don't put, uh, even though this is even worse for boys, don't get me wrong, we do not put girls first. And we really should be putting boys and girls first, children first. Yes. And uh, because we put women first, we do not put girls first. 
so and, uh, and admittedly boys are are put almost dead last uh but just to, to focus on that for a second so we have situations where an adult woman can make choices that that deprive a girl of her father i mean right. and that and that is a, and again i'm just focusing on this right now what about that girl's right to her father you know like th but that's okay because a woman a woman benefits so it's a situation where where women are actually over girls are are more important than girls and and i mean even when you look at that 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 that's a completely dysfunctional society because we we have become we have inverted ourselves um from what i think that is uh, what is reasonable or natural when it comes to to vulnerability boys and girls are the most vulnerable we put them first and then we put the you know then the adults and it's not a situation where adults are less valuable it's just a situation where they're less vulnerable you know it's it, they they're capable of taking care of themselves more and we we haven't done that and what we end up with is an even more dysfunctional society when these children who have been put second over adults adult women who should be pulling their own weight grow up yeah i guess the only other thing i would say is um that it's probably possible the woman who put her baby in the microwave that the reason she got to that point of dysfunction was because she was a woman it wasn't acceptable to tell her firmly that her dysfunction was wrong yeah. Once she's an adult and, and she's when she's a kid, if she's dysfunctional as a kid, she's going to be ignored because, uh, you know, if she say she lived with a single mom, that would that would be a situation where she'd be ignored and her needs would be ignored because the mother would be first. Mm -hmm. But as an adult, instead of her needs being taken care of, it would be her wants taken care of, being taken care of because the minute that you start bossing her around, as she would probably have thought of it. Um, you're imposing on her, mm -hmm. and that's an area where the threat narrative can be harmful to women. Well, yeah, it's it, well. I'm I'm going to get into that more, but it's this is, I, I think this is good for this one, eh? Mm -hmm. But the threat narratives are definitely harmful for women, and I will go over that. But uh, yeah, well, thanks for like chatting with me and and about this, and. Uh, talking oh, this to was you. fun. Yeah, it was probably fun. do it again. Yeah. <laughs> like we could do it again as soon as as soon as we both have some time, eh? Yeah. And we're not doing a radio show or whatever else. Maybe this weekend. Possibly this weekend. Possibly. Well, yeah, I know you're really busy on weekends, so. Yeah. Yeah, whenever you have another day off and then um uh we'll talk about uh I want to talk about actually how why boys are so vulnerable to becoming the people who are dominated by threat narratives and uh and who who have this desire to earn a sense of belonging and where that comes from and maybe what we could do to start to challenge that and eventually i also want to talk about why girls are so vulnerable to becoming to, to defining themselves by threat by embodying by embodying threat narratives by creating threat narratives and maybe what we can start to do to change that as well those are those sound like really good topics um i'm probably because my my youngest is a boy i've got two stepdaughters and and then my son um my stepdaughters are older they're actually adults now mm -hmm. uh, but my son is 14 and I, I'm starting to sort of see some of um, some of that coming home from school, um, just little stories about stuff that goes on at school. So I'm probably going to be really interested in both of those because you know he's he's dealing with girls. Um, my girls have dealt with; uh, they're different, and in order to, uh, you know, they're not really they're not unaccepted by other girls, but they never were. Um, they never were the type that fit, really, really fit in. They mm -hmm. were both very nice in school and everything, but they didn't get clicky. They were just friends with everybody, and so they didn't have a click. 
Mm -hmm. And so it'll be interesting to learn more about, you know, and I was like that too. I mean, I hung out with everybody in high school, but not, um, extensively or, um, or as part of a, part of a tight knit group. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. So it'd be interesting to see, to sort of learn about what that is. And in my case, I was just sort of the strange outsider. And I was the ponytail girl that hid behind her books, except I hid behind a camera instead. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it, it's given me a good perspective. Um, instead of being part of this stuff, I just watched it. Yeah. And uh, And I watched it and I thought about it. And here we are, talking about it. <laughs> uh, that's probably a good note to end off on. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yep, that's the next one. We'll talk about uh, boys and why they tend to fall prey to their particular role in the threat narrative. And, and uh, yeah, so see you then. All right, see you then.